Hi, Susie Rhodes here with Past Masters. Welcome to this week's questions of the week. This week, our video is going to cover questions that you'll find on the SIE exam. So if you're taking the Securities Industry Essentials exam, then this video is for you. During this week's video, I'm going to cover questions related to Section 2 from FINRA's content outline. Let me show you. FINRA publishes an SIE content outline so that I know exactly what to include within my Past Masters course. Section two of the content outline is quite broad. It is understanding products and their risks. It is 44% of your test. Remember the SIE exam has 75 questions. 33 of them are related to this section. Passing on the SIE exam is a 70%. Let's check out our section exam within our Past Masters Learning Management System. Purchasing ADRs facilitate ADR, American Depository Receipt. Read all four choices. Foreign trading of domestic securities. Foreign trading in U.S. securities. U.S. trading in foreign securities or domestic trading of foreign government securities. An American depository receipt facilitates U.S. trading in foreign securities. So multinational banks will buy the foreign stock, keep it in the foreign country. They create a receipt. It's similar to owning the common stock, but the ADR trades here in the United States. So having an investor own an ADR is wonderful for diversification. So you choose what you believe is a correct answer. As you can see, we got it right. We got a green check mark. You can click show explanation and read the rationale. And you can also purchasing ADRs facilitate. Listen, all of our questions have audio explanations for you. An importer should be concerned most with which of the following types of risks. So an importer is buying foreign goods, bringing them in to this country. As an economy, the United States loves cheap goods produced in China. We are a consumer society after all. So an importer should be concerned with country risk, market risk, currency risk, or reinvestment risk. The correct answer is currency risk. Your client sold some municipal bonds resulting in a long-term capital gain of $20,000. Which statement is true regarding the taxability of this gain? The gain is tax-free at the federal level but taxable at the state level. The gain is tax-free. The gain is taxable at both the state and federal level, or the gain is taxable at the state level, but tax-free federally. So municipal bonds pay interest income that is tax-free federally, taxable at the state level, unless the bond is from the same state that the investor lives in. But this isn't a question about interest income. Be careful. It's a question about a long-term capital gain. Long-term capital gains are always taxable, both at the state and federal levels. Did it get you? Be careful. Which of the following can only be set up for a child? 529 plan, ESA, college savings plan, or prepaid tuition plan? Well, college savings plans and prepaid tuition plans are types of 529 plans. The only one that can only be set up for a child is an ESA. ESAs can only be set up for someone under age 18. Which correctly describes treasury stock? Stock sold in an APO, additional public offering. Authorized but unissued stock, outstanding shares repurchased by the issuer, or stock issued by the United States government. Treasury stock. So treasury stock is when the issuer goes into the secondary market and buys back its own shares. 
Usually they do that because they have lots of cash and or they want to influence the price of their stock. The idea being the law of supply and demand, the less there is of something, the higher the price. Outstanding shares repurchased by the issuer, treasury stock. Which type of secured bond is backed by rolling stock, such as airplanes, collateral trust bond, mortgage bond, debenture, or equipment trust certificate? It is the equipment trust certificate that is backed by rolling stock. So fleet vehicles, airplanes, railroad cars, equipment trust certificate. Mutual fund shareholders may receive income in which of the following ways? Interest, dividends and capital gains, dividends or capital gains. So a mutual fund is a pooled investment and the pooled investment may pay up to quarterly dividends and once a year, it can also make a capital gain distribution. So there's two ways that a mutual fund shareholder may receive income, dividends and capital gains. So those are the capital gains that are the result of the portfolio itself, selling securities, netting its gains and losses together, and then distributing their gains to the shareholders at, at most one time a year. It's also true that the investor may have purchased the shares at 50 and then Later on, if it's an open and mutual fund, redeemed them for 120, and they also have a capital gain at that point as well. But dividends up to quarterly, capital gain distributions at most one time a year. Those are the two ways that a mutual fund shareholder can receive income. Your client, Matt, inherited $150,000 worth of stock in Costco. Which type of risk should Matt be most worried about? Interest rate risk, market risk, business risk, or purchasing power risk? So he has all of this money, 150 grand in one company. So is there one of these that is stock specific? Business risk, it is stock specific or unsystematic is the one that Matt should be most concerned about. Which has the most interest rate risk? Stocks, bank CDs, treasury bonds, or treasury bills? Debt securities have more interest rate risk than equities. So we can get rid of stocks. That leaves us treasury bonds and T-bills. Bank CDs are not securities at all. You can tie up your money for various different periods of time. The bank promises to pay you a specific interest rate, but we're looking for the most interest rate risk. So we have two debt securities here that we're concerned about, treasury bonds and treasury bills. The rule says that the nearer to maturity a treasury bill matures in at most 52 weeks, the less interest rate sensitive the debt security is. A treasury bond matures in up to 30 years. So of those two, it is the more interest rate sensitive. Remember the inverse relationship between changes in interest rates and the market price of debt securities in the secondary market. The debt security has a promised nominal yield, coupon rate, interest rate, so that never changes. It's like a tattoo on my chest. As interest rates change, if interest rates, it's a little teeter-totter, right? If interest rates go up, the price of the bond goes down. If interest rates go down, the price of the bond in the secondary market is going to go up. Catherine has $250,000 in equities and no other investments. She should be most concerned with which of the following types of risks, regulatory, call, market, or financial. She's in the market. She's entirely in the market. It says she has no other investments. She should be most concerned with market risk. Units of ownership in a limited partnership are called shares, subscribers, units, or interests. 
The units of ownership are called interests. The people that own the interests, they're referred to as subscribers. Section two of the SIE has options questions. Let's check this one out. An investor is short one ABC 50 call at four. What do they need to cover this position? So they have shorted a option, shorted a call, which means simply that they've sold a call. When you sell a call, you've sold an obligation to sell your shares at the strike price here of 50. So what covers a short call? Owning the shares. Owning the shares covers a short call. So how many shares does this investor need to own to cover this call? 50? Is the one contract good for 50 shares? No. The one contract is good for one round lot of stock, which is 100 shares. So if the investor owned 100 shares of ABC, then this position would be a covered call. If they don't own the shares, then they're naked, they're uncovered and have unlimited risk. Your client owns shares of one S&P 500 company. He would like to reduce his business risk, which would help to accomplish this by international securities, by domestic securities, sell the shares of the one company and invest in an S&P 500 index fund or buy U.S. government bonds. So currently, the investor is really narrow, only has one company that's within the S&P 500, would like to reduce business risk. So you have to choose the best choice here. I'm going to go with sell the shares of the one company and invest in an S&P 500 index fund. That's the best choice here. In order for the interest paid by your municipal bond to be tax free at the state level, which of the following must be true? The bond must be from the investor's home state. I like that, but always read all four choices. The bond must be held for at least 10 years. No, the bond must be from another state. Well, if it was, then the interest income would be taxable on the investor's state income tax return. The bond must be from a state neighboring the investor's home state. No, in order for the interest income to be double exempt. So municipal bond interest income is always exempt at the federal level. In order for it to be exempt at the state level, the bond must be from the investor's home state. Expenses deducted from the separate account of a life insurance policy include all except. So which one is not an expense deducted from the separate account? Mortality expense, the commission, investment management fee, or the expense risk fee. Which one is not deducted from the separate account is the commission. The commission comes right off of the premium. The mortality expense, investment management fee, and expense risk fee, those are all expenses of the separate account. Which of the following is not insured by the FDIC? Savings account, checking account, bank CD, or a money market mutual fund purchased at the bank. So the FDIC protects clients if the bank goes broke. So it covers savings accounts, checking accounts, and the bank CD, but it does not cover a money market mutual fund, even if it was purchased at the bank. If it was a money market savings account, however, then it would have been covered. Stock dividends are taxed when declared, when received, when the shares are sold, or when paid. There's a very important word in this question, be careful. Stock dividends. It's not a question about cash dividends. Cash dividends are taxable when they're received, when they're paid. 
in the year of the distribution. But a stock dividend is not taxed until the shares are sold. So when an issuer pays a stock dividend, the investor ends up with more shares at a lower cost per share so that the stock dividend is not taxed until the shares are sold. All are false about direct participation programs except what is true about DPPs. They are liquid investments? No, they're not. Limited partners have unlimited liability? No, limited partners have limited liability. Losses can be written off against ordinary income? Mm, not since 1986. There must be one or more general partners. That is the only true statement about a DPP. Which type of preferred stock would receive an omitted dividend? Convertible, participating, cumulative, or straight? It is cumulative preferred stock that if a dividend is omitted must be paid then the current dividend is paid before common stockholders can ever receive another dividend. Cumulative preferred stock. Private funds are suitable for wealthy investors, for all investors, for institutional investors only, or for most investors. Private funds are only suitable for, let's see, wealthy investors. They're not suitable for everybody. A UGMA account must be a margin account, a cash account, a joint account, or a brokerage account. An UGMA account. So an UGMA account is account for the benefit of a minor, Uniform Gift to Minors Act. That's what UGMA stands for. An UGMA account must be a cash account. So there is one minor per account, and then there is one custodian for each account. The custodian does not have to be the parent, but does have to be someone that is of legal age. It is not a joint account. It can't be a margin account. It must be a cash account, and all transactions must be paid in full. The minor social security number is used in an UGMA or UTMA account. Which of the following would have an adverse effect on the return of an equity REIT? So an equity REIT owns buildings. A mortgage REIT would own the mortgages, so an equity REIT owns buildings. So we're looking for an adverse effect. High occupancy rates, high property values, low interest rates, and overbuilding. Which one would have an adverse effect on the return of an equity REIT? Overbuilding would have an adverse effect on the return of an equity REIT. High occupancy rates, high property values, and low interest rates would all have a positive effect on an equity REIT. Limited partners in a DPP have limited liability, a voice in management, expose their personal assets to business risk, or unlimited liability. Limited partners in a DPP have limited liability. It is the general partners that have unlimited liability. All are true regarding UTMAs except what is false regarding UTMAs. Most states are not UTMA states. They offer more investment flexibility than UGMA accounts. When established, the account must have one custodian and one minor. They allow the custodian to remain trustee longer than a UGMA, usually until age 25. So we're looking for which is the false statement regarding UTMAs. Most states are UTMA states. So must states are not UTMA states is going to be the right answer because it is the false statement. The other three are all true. What is most commonly used to measure a stock's market risk? Beta, 
earnings per share, price earnings ratio, or alpha. It's beta. When a security has a beta of one, that means it moves with the S&P 500, the market as a whole. So if the S&P 500 is up 10%, your stock has a beta of one, then your stock will also be up 10%. So a beta of greater than one is aggressive, less than one is defensive. So beta is most commonly used to measure a stock's market risk. Which type of equity holder has voting rights? Common stock, preferred stock, common and participating preferred, or common and preferred stock. So it is the residual claim on assets, who gets paid last in the event of a corporate liquidation, that also has the voting rights. Common stockholders have voting rights. Preferred stock does not have voting rights. Your client has $200,000 in bank CDs. She should be most concerned with which type of risk? Business, interest rate, inflation, or market? So she's not in the market. Bank CDs are not securities at all. Interest rate risk is something you find with bonds. Bonds market price will change inversely related to interest rate changes. Business risk, no, she's not invested in any specific company. Now it doesn't say how long the bank CD is good for, but let's say they're five year bank CDs. She should be most concerned with inflationary risk. So when she puts that money into the bank CD, she's choosing, not that she has a choice, she's gonna get whatever the current interest rates that the bank CDs are paying. And then during that five year, in my example, period of time, she can't change what the interest rate is that it's paying. So that in the end, if inflation is more than the interest rate that she earned, she has purchasing power risk, inflationary risk. Of the following, which type of investment company has an investment manager? Holding companies, management company, unit investment trust, or face amount certificate company. Under the Investment Company Act of 1940, there are three types of investment companies, but only one of the three has an investment manager, and that is the management company. So sometimes the test is that easy. I will hope for lots of easy questions for you. A treasury note pays interest semi-annually, annually, quarterly, or upon maturity. A treasury note pays interest twice a year, semi-annually. Another options question. Ben buys 100 shares of stock at 80 so he's long stock at 80. He also buys a May 74 put at five. So he was out of his pocket 80 when he bought the stock and he's out of his pocket five when he bought the put. The put is going to be his downside risk insurance. If the stock price should fall to zero, which is the worst case scenario, what is the most that Ben will lose? So when you're long a stock and you're long a put, that's the best kind of hedge you can have because a put gives Ben the power to sell his shares at the strike price of 74. So that even if the stock price goes to zero, Ben will sell his shares at 74. So he was out 80 to buy the stock, out five to buy the put. Let's pretend that the stock price goes to zero. He sells his shares, creating money in his pocket, 74. So that when the stock price or if the stock price should go to zero, the most that he will lose is $1,100. So keep track of this on your scratch paper. Out 80, out five in 74. Another way of looking at it, 80 is what he paid to buy the stock. He has a contract to be able to sell the stock at 74. So that is a $6 a share loss. 
he also paid $5 a share for the put option. So six plus five, that's $11 a share. The contract is for 100 shares, 11 times 100 is $1,100. So you can do it either way. They both give you the right answer. So he was long a stock and long an option. That's the most he can lose if the stock price should go to zero. Lupita funded her qualified annuity with $100,000. When she died at age 70, her account balance was $219,000. She had not annuitized the contract. Which describes the death benefit best? So 219 is the account balance. Let's see. Her beneficiary will receive the account balance of 219, but will owe taxes as ordinary income on the growth in the contract. What kind of an annuity is it? It's a qualified annuity. So what's her cost basis? Zero. So it's not that. Her beneficiary will receive the account balance of 219, but will owe taxes as ordinary income on the entire amount. Since it was a qualified annuity, I like that. Her beneficiary will receive the account balance of 219 tax-free. No, it's not life insurance. Her beneficiary will receive the account balance of 219, but will owe taxes at long-term capital gains rates. No, ordinary income rates. So the beneficiary gets the account balance and owes ordinary income on the entire balance. Rights are options that are good for 30 years, 90 days, nine months, or 30 days. Rights are options that are good for 30 days. Calls and puts are good for nine months. Warrants are good for up to 30 years. Systematic risk is determined by current tax law, risk that cannot be diversified away, related to the financial health of the company, or stock-specific risk. Systematic risk is risk that cannot be diversified away. It's things like market risk, interest rate risk, and inflationary risk or purchasing power risk. So simply owning lots of different company stocks is not going to reduce systematic risk. Diversification by asset class, however, will help reduce systematic risk. We did it. We got 100%. Great job. I hope you learned something. If you did, be sure to give this video a thumbs up. Subscribe to our channel and turn those notifications on. If you have any questions at all, just ask me in the comments below. If you'd like to check out Past Masters Securities course offerings or to enroll in any of our programs, there's a link found in this video's description. Thank you so much for watching. I hope to have you as a student soon. Happy studies. You got this.